14th, 2017, it is Mother's Day. That's not why we have flowers. We have flowers just because we like flowers. Yeah, they come from the garden outside. Yeah, the front garden, not the back garden, yeah. which would be the backyard. Uh, never mind, I, I'm off on, on weirdness here. Uh, I got a handful of announcements uh, to get out of the way. First of all, welcome to the show. This is a live call-in show. Uh, the number appears directly above Jen's name. And uh, the lines are full, so if you're wanting to call right now, you, you, you're not going to get through. Uh, but we, we like to engage with, uh, well, lots of different people. But the primary thing is we're a bunch of godless heathens. We are atheists. We're non-believers. We are free thinkers, skeptics. What, use whatever label you want. Uh, and we'd like to know what people believe and why, perhaps have a discussion, perhaps a heated argument where I get mad and hang up on somebody. You never know. Uh, I would pr much prefer uh, good discussions. But uh, announcements-wise, we are sponsored by the Atheist Community of Austin. We are here at the Atheist Community of Austin's Free Thought Library. Uh, and if it weren't for the green screen, you'd, you'd be able to see books. And there's people on the other side of the glass, and they're surrounded by books. I mean, we've, we've got a couple of books. Yeah, we have a few. That. Today was the elections for the Atheist Community of Austin. If you go to atheist-community.org, I don't know if the results are up yet, but I'm sure they will be soon. Uh, basically, we elect nine board members, including a president and vice president. Russell Glasser uh, won and will continue to be the president of the Atheist Community of Austin. Our own Phil Sessions, who occasionally co-hosts, will be the new vice president of the ACA. And there are seven other board members at large. Um, by the way, you're all welcome to join the Atheist Community of Austin. If you're here in Austin, uh, you can join and you can participate and you can show up for elections and you can volunteer to help out with all the various efforts that we've got going on um, because the ACA does not just act as a sponsor for the Atheist Experience TV show. Right. Uh, there's a lot of other efforts as well. Our, I know our yearly bat cruise is coming up in September. Um, I've already talked to some people about uh, some events that are maybe coinciding with that, but the, today's announcements are much nearer. Uh, as a reminder, the, the Nonprofits uh, podcast is now streaming live on YouTube every Wednesday, or uh, every first and third Wednesday, so twice a month. Um, you can go to atheist-community.org and find more information about Nonprofits podcast. The Atheist Community of Austin is hosting the Against Malaria Foundation fundraiser next Saturday, the 20th, from 7 to 12 p.m. They'll be talking about effective altruism uh, using data instead of dogma to better inform how we go about doing good. Uh, and on the next day, the, the 21st, Chris Johnson, author of A Better Life, who's been a guest on the show before, and I've, we've done interviews, and, and we're all cozy friends. He's going to be at Austin Oasis at the Turner Roberts Recreational Center from 1030 to noon. Um, I think that's all the announcements I had. I'm not positive. Yeah, I think so. I don't yeah. know. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, we are working on uh, getting a special guest in for next month. Sweet. To talk about religious trauma syndrome. So stay tuned for more details. I'm still working on details on that. Yeah, so this was, you know, every second Sunday is the Atheist Community of Austin's lecture series uh, that we host at the Austin History Center. We were there today. We have the elections. And uh, the speaker today was our own Russell Glasser giving yeah. kind of this state of the ACA address, which, which is required. Uh, but we do a number of other events. If, if the special guest doesn't work out, then uh, June 11th, I'll be doing a lecture on magic and skepticism. And so I'll be doing some magic and talking about it. And if the special guest shows up, then we will shift me to some other time because I'm here all the time. I can yeah. I can walk over. Well, I wouldn't walk to the yeah, so that'd be a, long a hike, little, yeah. little bit of a hike, especially carrying props. Yeah. But so it's Mother's Day. Yes. Yes. What some, we, well, 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 go ahead. Some people have great mothers. Some people have crappy mothers. So I don't tell people call your mom because maybe that's not something they want to do. But yeah. you know. It's one of those things where I, I know people who are estranged from their mom. Yeah. And there's this impulse to say, oh, just, just call her. Yeah. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a, that it would be a bad idea for them to call. I don't necessarily think it's a good idea for people to be pushing that right. direction. Um, it may be that the best thing they could do is call because uh, that surprise call could work to mend fences. Maybe minds have changed a little bit or you never know. Uh, but I don't know what somebody's relationship is like with their mother right. on either side. Uh, so I'm not going to be saying, oh, go call your mom. Yeah, yeah. if your parents were not um, 
I guess, very good to you when you were growing up, you're not under any obligation to call them. So um, don't, feel, don't feel social pressure today to call your mom if your mom wasn't good to you. On the flip side, if you forgot today was Mother's Day and you're in this sort of relationship with your mother where things are good and they would be bad if you forgot to call, then by all means, call your mom. No, no sense in, in uh, letting a forgetful mind cripple a, a relationship. Anyway, did you have, I forgot to ask if you had a topic that you well, were going to The ask. only thing I wanted to bring up is that we have a lot of people sometimes who ask why we do this show. Um, it's a recurring theme. So... The Texas Ledge is in town right now, and the Texas Ledge is really good about giving us a reason to keep doing this show. That's that's short for le legislature. Yeah, the yeah, the, it's Texas slang. We call our legislature the Ledge. Um, we don't have a professional legislature, which is probably a good thing because I can't even imagine what this place would be like if they were here all the time. Hmm. Um, but basically, they they have um, a number of bills. Uh, that amount to basically writing discrimination into the law in Texas. Um, you know, it, it's like if there's some fun happening in Texas, the ledge rolls in and says, well, we got to ban that, you know, or even if it's just people living their lives. So there's a number of anti-transgender bills out there, the bathroom bill that um, looks like it's headed to the governor's desk for signature. If he it hasn't should go signed. directly into the bathroom and get flushed right down it, the exactly, toilet. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, threats to our children out there, but transgender people using the restroom is not one of them. Um, so this is, it's just outrageous. There's another bill that's been submitted and it's been filed that, that would require um, public school teachers and guidance counselors to disclose to the child's parents if this child says that they're transgender or gay or anything, and this may put the child at risk. So, you know, the school is supposed to be a safe place. And public schools, um, shocking to some people, but public schools are actually a firewall against child abuse because you've got people who are trained to help children, to educate them, who are looking out for kids who might be in an abusive situation. And now you're requiring them to disclose to a, a potentially abusive parent that this child is, is transgender or gay. Um, so that's one of the bills that's been filed. Uh, there's another bill that would allow um, any child that, that falls under some kind of agency or even a private organization, um, if that child is, for example, in foster care and is, um, is under the care of a, an organization um, that is religious, that child could be subjected to um, basically the, the reparative therapy stuff. Yeah. And you know, that is child abuse. Um, kids kill themselves when they're subjected to that sort of thing. So that's one of the things that's happening. Um, the other one is that um, there's a bill that's been filed that uh, would allow uh, religiously affiliated agencies that take state money to discriminate against people for uh, people who do not follow their religious beliefs or who are gay or um, there's like a laundry list of stuff. If it violates their sincerely held religious beliefs, then they can discriminate against people, including placing children at risk in foster care. And the, the um, excuse for this bill is that it, it opens the possibility of these agencies participating in helping children, and therefore more children will be you know, taken out of abusive situations. In fact, it does just the opposite. When when a kid needs a foster placement, um, I don't think the kid really cares whether they get placed in you know an environment where it's a a married Christian family versus you know a single lesbian mom or you know a single gay dad or a couple or whatever. The kid just wants a safe place, um, and this this law will not help address the problem that the Texas foster care system has. It just places more kids at risk. It's, it's really kind of strange. I, I guess it's, it, so I've had a lot of conversations about how to be more effective at having conversations. And one of, one of the things I repeatedly suggest is that you don't make accusations that you can't back up and you don't mm -hmm. pretend that you can read somebody's mind and talk about their motivation. So instead of saying, oh, they want to control sex or they want to punish trans people, mm -hmm. 
instead talk about what they're actually doing, that they're imposing legislation which has the effect of, you know, being unfair or, or right. damaging, and, and, and not talk about their motivations. Except that there, there's so much obsession over, fr from the religious right in particular, mm -hmm. over what other people are doing, yeah. about how they identify, about whether or not they're having sex. It, it's, it is an obsession uh, that I, I think just can't, cannot be healthy for anybody. Right. Uh, and if that's the one, there are real big issues that um, reasonable people can potentially disagree on. And there are some big fights and, and, and legislative issues that we should really focus on, you know. Yeah. And there are changes that are going to be coming in the future. And if we can't get this this sizable chunk of the population to stop obsessing over who I'm having sex with or not having sex with. Right. I don't know how we have those other conversations. Yeah, and, and they're willing to put this idea that, uh, they're, that somehow their religious liberty is in jeopardy if they can't discriminate against a qualified foster parent, for example, hmm. or a transgender person who just wants to relieve themselves in the bathroom. Yeah, you know, I heard today that Oregon may be having um, gender-neutral driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. that they may have a non but you, so you would either have an M, an F, or an X, essentially, yeah. is what they're, they're yep. going with. Um, curiously, the discussion, there didn't seem to be much objection about this on even reactionary grounds. It was all about how much is it going to cost for us to change the, you right. know, because everybody's high in Oregon, and, <laughs> and they're all fine with whatever you want to do. I mean, yeah. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that when I first heard it, I had a reaction, the sort of uh, visceral trained reaction that many other people do. It was like, oh, come on, is this a bridge too far? To, isn't, aren't we going to have a rash of people who just go ahead and put X on there? And what does that do? You know, let's, let's start going down. The, oh, we have men's prisons. We have women's prisons. Do we have to have X prisons now too? And it took I, probably 15 seconds of sitting there mulling this over to go, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is not a big deal because if I'm truly, if I'm truly going to treat people equally, uh, then I don't just need two categories. I need as many categories as there are people who want to put themselves in categories right. and it shouldn't matter to me. And I, I do think that there's a potential problem with things like the prison system about how do we re revamp right. longstanding institutions to conform to changes in our understanding about people. I'd like to think that we're up to the task. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the prison thing is interesting because, I mean, part of the reason we have, you know, men's prisons and women's prisons is a recognition that if you put female-identified persons in with male-identified persons, the female-identified persons are probably going to get raped. I mean, a lot. And that overlooks the fact that in men's prisons, there's a lot of male-identified people that are getting raped. And in fact, it there's there's this thing, and I can't wor remember where I read it, but it was essentially saying that if um, a juvenile offender went before a judge and was sentenced to 30 days in prison, that was basically a sentence of rape. Because you put a juvenile offender into an adult prison mm. for 30 days, they're going to get raped. And we should be outraged at that. We should be doing something about this because there is no provision in any U.S. law that says that the, the penalty for committing any crime is that you get raped. Yeah, and I'm not going to pretend to know what the solution is for, with regard to the, the penal system and other stuff. Um, but I, I do think that we're capable of having those conversations yes. and coming to reasonable solutions. Um, it's not like, it's not like the, our penal code, our, our prison system is this shining beacon of awesomeness. Yeah. Uh, it's probably due for some serious revamps anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, it just it's, it strikes me that the things that people, I almost think that it's a way of avoiding the bigger issues that they don't have any thoughts right. or, or ideas about and just focus on the one thing. Because if I can keep this from changing, I don't have to worry about the 10 changes that are going to come after it. Right. Uh, that, that, that is, you know, not to pretend like I can tell you what their motivation is, but I, I've seen people who seem to be so fearful of 
a change five steps down the line that they see right down that slippery slope and they want to say, no, 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 we can't change this one thing because that would cause me to, I just can't process it. I have to think, and then what about this? And what about this? And if we, if we allow women to marry women, what, why are we, what, won't we have to let people marry kangaroos next? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's the sort of thing that I, I find incredibly frustrating. Now, I still think it's a bad idea to go around and assert that you have in fact discerned someone's motivation. Uh, because, you know, if you take things like uh, uh, abortion, a woman's right to choose, when I was opposed to choice, um, it wasn't because I wanted to control women's bodies or uh, control sex or punish people for having sex. Those, were, those motivations never entered my consciousness. I bought into a bunch of bull, and if somebody had come up to me and said, oh, you just want to punish people for having sex, well, now you seem absurd. But when somebody comes up to me instead and says, the things you're advocating have the effect of punishing people for having sex, and you don't seem mm -hmm. to care about that as much as you care about whatever your position is. Okay, now all of a sudden I have to do some serious thinking because you're no longer obviously wrong to me. Yeah. You're, you're now talking about what I'm doing. And I, I, I would hope that we can start, you know, or continue to focus on what people are doing. Yeah. But you want to get to some callers? Absolutely. All right. We have uh, Sean in Paw Paw, Michigan. Thanks for waiting, and thanks for helping us out with the call screening test earlier. Oh, no problem. No big deal. What do you got for us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can we hear you just we fine. We can. Yes, I'd like to bring up uh, IEG, Intelligent External Guidance, into this uh, equation. Into which and equation? Asked, um, well, basically, Intelligent External Guidance is, uh, I'm saying that it's a fact that both Matt and Jen, their existence today is because of intelligent external guidance in their life. I, I agree. Matt, I exist today because my in externally intelligent parents had sex. Yep. I'm glad we're on the same page with that. Um, you guys, then you guys acknowledge that. So you guys also acknowledge that you guys are part of this uh, universe as well. That you're intricate and intricately interwoven with this universe. That you're part of this universe. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, we're part of the universe. Uh, I, I would agree. I'm part of the universe. This is this is like stellar because we're in complete agreement so far. Yeah. Well, excellent. So since we're in agreement on that, so for it, now if someone brings to you guys, hey, you know what? There's an intelligent creator behind every bit of it in the uh, rudiment, rudimentary stage of this universe when it was actually coming about, when it, when it was coming into existence. Mm -hmm. If someone said, well, there's an intelligent creator behind it, looking at yourselves and weighing yourselves into this equation, you could not say that, well, we know, we, we know for a fact that there's not. No. In, in fact, you have to say that, you know, there's a possibility that there was an intelligent creator behind it all. I, I won't say that there's a possibility. I'm saying that we can't demonstrate that it didn't, that it, that it isn't the case, but that doesn't mean that all it right. happened or that it's possible. Those are things that, right, well, those are yeah, things, right that, those are things, Sean, those are things yes. that, that, that it is possible and that it happened. Those are claims that need to be demonstrated. Exactly. Well, right now we know for a fact that it happens right now in the here and now. There's not a human being on this planet no, that can make no. it out of so, Sean, this is, this is the where, where you're confusing. The reason I'm okay with the idea of intelligent external guidance in a scenario is because we have a demonstration of it. My parents had sex. They are intelligent. They are external to me. And this is the case. But that doesn't mean that there's an internal, an intelligent external guidance behind everything. But there's that possibility where you can't. How do you know that? It's, how do you know that it's possible? Because of you, you just said you agreed with me that you exist today. You were never made out of your infancy stage without so, intelligent external so I can, in your life. I can light a match right here and demonstrate that I'm able to light a match. Does that mean I can light a match in outer space? Well, not really. <laughs> okay. So there you go. So you can't argue from the specific to the general. You can't say that because something can be demonstrated in this way, in this time, in this place, that something analogous can yeah, actually occur. Well, you could actually light a match in outer space. So here, here's the thing. Every example we have of intelligence exists where? And actually, within creatures on this blue marble. Yeah. Even monkeys yeah. demonstrate all kinds so, of intelligence. So, so wh what makes you think that, that there is intelligence beyond this blue marble? Well, there ha we're, here for, we're here because of some reason, are we not? No. No? 
You don't acknowledge yourself as existing right now? Of course Talk we now? of course we exist. The point of objection that Jen and I raised was not to our existence, but to your assertion that we exist because of a reason. As if there, you, you, were impl I, you were implying some side of purpose that would require an actor to, to make this decision. Can I ask you guys something right now? Are you guys both right now intelligently and intentionally directing your thoughts right now with me on this, on this show? As far as I can tell. Yeah. So that, that possibility is, is overwhelming to, to, for someone to say, no, they know that they don't believe that it's out there beyond no. the blue marble with amongst Sean, the millions of billions of stars that are out there. Sean, the fact that I can direct my intelligence toward a goal doesn't mean that there's some intel intelligence beyond the universe that is directed towards a goal. Well, I, I say this, though. You exist because of it. Well, how do you know that? Yeah. How do I know that? Well, without your mother, a test tube, or your father, an uncle, and I've already conceded. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, what does that have to do with this claim that there's some, you know, deity or something outside? <laughs> well, purpose this in this life, right? Like everything has a purpose in this life, and everything. Wait, what, do, what do you mean? What, what do you mean by that? Well, let's take this on in, in the biology right now. Every cell, group of cells, every organism, group of organisms are dependent upon and influenced by others within their environment. That you know? you're, you're talking about function. Yeah. You're not talking yeah. about purpose. Well, your existence is because of what, the, what that actually does, what it, what that function is, what it does. Correct. Sure. You guys' existence because of that. You guys rely upon higher sources in your life. You acknowledge that, correct? Well, what are higher what, sources? What higher sources are you talking about? Oh, uh, we're asking the same well, questions. I know. I'll yeah. let you do it. <laughs> I'm just going to... All right, well, higher source, just to break it down and then use the main higher source right now, the sun. Without the sun, you would not exist. That's but not a higher source. That's a celestial the body. body. It's a star. The sun's not dependent... Would you agree that the sun's not dependent upon you for its existence? That's correct. But you are totally dependent upon the sun for, for your existence. Yes, as is everything so on this power, planet. It doesn't have to be an intelligent higher power, but it's still an intelligent power. It's still so, a higher power. Michael. Okay, if you're going to okay. define the sun as a higher power, then that, you know, I, I acknowledge that the sun exists and we are dependent on it for our existence. So isn't it, isn't it reasonable for human beings to look towards that? To the say, sun? hey, you know what? The, 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 the evidence is so overwhelming that it's all around you that, hey, you know what? To believe in God, it's, everything's pointing in that, that direction. To say it's well, not is to go against the of your own makeup. I don't see anything no. that's pointing in yeah. the direction of a God. The fact that the fact that one thing you want to call the sun a higher power—it's not the highest source. God is the highest highest source. Well, okay, feel how, free to demonstrate how do you that. know that? Because the because power. okay, if using your model for higher power is that my existence is contingent upon this higher power, which actually isn't true because the sun could cease to exist and I would continue to exist, albeit for a short period of time. Uh, it is the persistence that, that requires the energy that's coming from the sun that feeds the planet and blah, blah, blah. But if you want to say that... Then we're going fine, yeah. So, so but your, your thing is the sun is a higher power because our, our, our persistence, it depends upon it, okay? If, if we want to go down that road, then we would get to something like the laws of physics in the universe because the sun is dependent upon those things uh, to be the way they are in order for it, it to continue to exist, Right. And there are things that are consistent. You, would you agree that things are consistent? I, like I asked a question. Excuse uh, me? So I asked a question that was about your model for, the, for higher sources or higher powers or whatever, that uh, if you're going to put the sun ahead of, uh, higher than us, then you would put the laws of physics ahead of the sun, right? Uh, certainly. Okay. I would have to. Sure. So I have no reason to see anything beyond the physics. Even though you yourself exist because of intelligent external guidance in your life. I don't, I, I, okay, because there was an intelligent decision made by other intelligent beings that I can demonstrate, that, that, that's the time to concede the point. It's when there's a demonstration that it's accurate. If I had no, no evidence of parents, like if I just uh, woke up one day and I was the only human being and had no history, and didn't know anything about sexual reproduction. Maybe we can't even say that I was the result of sexual reproduction in this hypothetical. What reason would I have to conclude that my parents were real? 
Well, in that hypothetical scenario, you wouldn't. Right, which is, right. now you can expand that hypothetical well, scenario. Right. You can expand well, that, you yeah. can, Sean, you can expand that hypothetical scenario to be directly analogous to your claim of a God. I have no evidence for that proposition. You don't want to extrapolate so far that you just take everything out of the equation and say, hey, I don't believe this because I don't want to believe when I have all these overwhelming facts. It has me. nothing to do. Yeah. It has nothing to do with what we want to believe. It has everything to do with what can be demonstrated. Well, what's demonstrated that we know for a fact right now, for human beings at least, is that we are totally dependent upon intelligent external guidance. I'm also, so I'm also totally dependent on oxygen. Does that mean there's an ultimate oxygen somewhere? Well, there's intelligent people that actually administer oxygen to elderly and other people that actually have problems with their lungs and whatnot. Yeah. You know? Has God ever administered oxygen to somebody? Well, he's the very breath. He gives the very breath that you breathe right now that you're even able to engage with me on this show. How, right how now. do you know feel, that? Feel free to demonstrate that. Do what? Demonstrate how? that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can say it. I can say anything. I can well, say that it's walking. not a god that that is responsible for life, but it's universe creating pixies, and and they also deliver the oxygen to me well, as well. Right, mathematically, this is what I'm saying. Mathematically, there's not a human being on this planet that can say no. There was no intelligent external guidance behind it all. Okay, so However, what? With, okay. The that, uh, with the facts that we have in here it, now that, it, that we Sean? know for a fact that humans are totally dependent on it, Sean? we can say that it's the mathematics in the equation, yes. Is there a human being that can definitively say that it isn't universe creating pixies? Say that it's not pixies? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think they can actually. Okay. Okay. So now we have two. That now means, we have Sean. 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 Uh, Sean. Sean. Now we have two competing hypotheses that serve as an explanation for the universe. And your argument for God is that basically nobody can prove it's not God. And then you just well, ignore Sean. You I'm gonna you I'm gonna put your ass on hold if you don't let me finish my sentence. I didn't tell everybody you're gonna hang up on me because you can't handle facts. Oh, please. Hey, jackass, present some facts and let's see how well yeah. I handle them because you are the one who just acknowledged that the competing hypothesis of pixies is just as is just as unfalsifiable as your God proposition. We've repeatedly asked you to demonstrate it, and all you've done is dribble on about how we can't prove it's not God. Here's your last chance. Demonstrate it. To demonstrate it? Yes. Yes. For you to exist today, there was intelligent external guidance in your life. I don't this think you understand fact. math. Yeah. You think that this, if, it wasn't. if you guys want to throw pixies into the equation, if you want to throw a fly, flying How can you monsters, dispute the pixies? Yeah. They're sure delivering you your oxygen a molecule at a time. How Those you... pixies died for you. That's right. <laughs> How dare you be rude Do to what? the pixies? They better say they're intelligent than if you want to throw them into the equation. Don't forget to do that. Of course yes. pixies are intelligent. Well, if you want to throw whatever you want to use. You know what else? Pixies also understand math. That's right. And they know that there's okay. no variable for a god, so no mathematical thing is going to be able to prove a god or pixies, which is why you acknowledge this. Acknowledge what? You acknowledged a moment ago when you said that, mathematically speaking, nobody can prove that it wasn't a god, also, people can't prove that it wasn't pixies. So we have two... Where's those intelligent ones, though? Sorry? Intelligent pixies. Make sure you use that. Intelligent pixies. Oh, for fuck's sake, pixies are intelligent by definition. I've already acknowledged that. The issue here... Can you Sorry? say that it's a possibility that, got, that there's intelligence? I'm not, I'm not saying it's a possibility. Oh, my God. Sean. Sean do, Sean, do you know what unfalsifiable means? I certainly do. Please, please explain to the class. I'm just bringing the two facts in right now. I'm not talking you about explain what unfalsifiable means or you're done. Unfalsifiable? Yes. It, it, it can't be proven one way or the other. No, it that means that it can't be proven false. Unfalsifiable. It's right there in the damn name. Something that's unfalsifiable could potentially be demonstrated to be accurate. And you got all this evidence around you. What do you do with it? What evidence? What evidence? There's no evidence. When we started this off, you both agreed. To, you both agreed with me. Yeah. You guys only take yourselves into the equation. Let me tell you why. You, it's called hedonism. No. That's why you guys okay. Into the you equation. remember what? It, hey, were you listening when I said to stop putting motivations into people? Because basically, you look like a jackass. 
When you say that we're refusing yeah, to believe yeah, because, of, because of hedonistic tendencies, when what we've acknowledged is that you presented an unfalsifiable proposition, and every single time we've asked you to demonstrate it, you duck and dodge and provide, and then you say, oh, with all this evidence around you. What evidence? Well, there's tremendous evidence around you, all oh, around uh, you. Where what you're doing right now? Bring it. What are you doing right now? You're directing your thought right now. Yes, and the yes. fact that I can doesn't mean that you can. I'm definitely doing it. I I, I doubt uh, that. I All doubt that. Phone As phone a matter of fact, I think that you are so far away from directly directing your intelligent thoughts. I think you're buying off on and repeating and regurgitating a script that you have come up with prior to this. Because when we ask you something that doesn't doesn't fit in with what you want to say, you don't answer. I ask, ask another question right now. Ask away. Please present evidence that would confirm the existence of a god. You mean tangible evidence, right? Physical, corporal, real, palpable. I'll, I'll take whatever you yeah, can whatever offer. You have. Because so far, because so far, I've pointed out, because everything you've pointed out so far, I've demonstrated is not evidence for a God. Right now, can I, can I, can I point out how dishonest that question right there in itself is? You want tangible, palpable evidence right now from me to you when I can't give it to you over this video screen. Actually, you're the one, say, hey, hey Sean, you're the one that said tangible, palpable evidence. I believe that I said I'll take whatever you've got, so bring it or get off. You agree with it. You already agree with it, and I thank you for that. You, I, My case is proven. You no, agree to we, it. We <laughs> Sorry. You can't say you know for a fact there is one. I can say that there's a great possibility. That okay. we, we agreed that we're part of the universe and that we have You're parents who had sex. Are you there? There's intent and population. Whether it's good or bad, that's another matter. Okay, let me ask yeah. you this, Sean. Let me ask you this, Sean. If I were to demonstrate an intentional act, from that, could you conclude that there was some other intentional act in another set of circumstances? In another set of circumstances? Correct. Like, for example, like, the like, like for example, the, um, are, are you watching? Sean are you, Sean, are you watching? Or are I'm you? seeing you guys. I'm okay. Right now. So okay. I'm holding up a pair of sunglasses. I don't see that yet. My computer's probably delayed. <laughs> okay. You'll catch up. You'll catch up. I'm holding up a pair of sunglasses, and I'm going to throw them. Now, we can say that that was an intentional act, and we can agree that it was an intentional act to throw those sunglasses. Does that tell okay, you... I'm following. Does that tell you in any way whether or not the rock that fell down the hill earlier was the result of an intelligent act? I, and you know what? That is awesome. Only if I you know. personally, personally tell me why you did that, then I would know. Hence, most of our relationships with Christ is no, not... No, 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 no. What is, I, I, uh, you directly observed me taking an act that we both would agree was an intelligent directed act, Right. Well, you know, there is magician-type deals you could do, but I've I seen that happen right now. Correct. i just seen you do that with the glasses. Okay. So we, are we in agreement that me throwing those glasses was an intelligent act? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was intelligent. All right. When I hang up on your ass, is that an intelligent I act? I could say, yes, it was an intelligent act because you were demonstrating something. I hope you had some reason of demonstrating that. Holy crap, Sean. I threw some glasses. Would you agree that that act was the result of an intelligent agent taking an action? I, I'd say you're intelligent. You just took an action. Yes, Jesus sir. fucking Christ. Sean, I got a question for you. Do you <laughs> Did you know this intelligently grab those glasses and throw them down and demonstrate? That's all I'm sure. asking you. Uh, would you agree that when I threw the glasses down, that this was the act of an intelligent agent? I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, cool. Now we're in agreement. Right. This, this was so simple. However, a little while ago, there was a big rock that came rolling down a hill. Does my throwing the glasses tell you whether or not that act of that rock was the result of an intelligent agent pushing it down the hill or something else? Well, there's many variables in that scenario. Right, but here's the question it's that you're yes not no listening question. to. Here's the question. Sean, Sean, stop. Listen to the question. Sean, listen to the question carefully. Does the fact does does the fact that you and I agree that me throwing glasses was an act of an intelligent agent tell you in and of itself whether or not the rock coming down the hill was the result of an intelligent action? 
I already know what you're getting at. And I, I never once said that every is other that, Is that why, why you're not movie. answering the damn simple yes or no question that you know the answer is no? It, it doesn't fully really demonstrate that. You, I don't see the rock for one. That's just something you're illustrating and I'm, I'm you know, concocting in my mind that as you're, you're, you're speaking it. And then Goodbye. The, the answer to the second question is no. The fact that I threw glasses doesn't tell you yeah. whether or not a rock was, that came down a hill was intelligent or not, which also demonstrates that the fact that we agreed that we had parents who had sex to produce us does not mean that there's an intelligent being outside of the universe serving as an ultimate director. You, you are arguing from the specific to the general, and that is fallacious. You cannot simply say that because I can light a match on Earth, I can light it in outer space. Or even on Mars. Uh... I'm glad you think you proved your case. Uh, I beg to differ. Yeah, there was a reason he didn't want to answer that question. I think it was, the first reason was he didn't understand it and was just suspecting that everything I asked was yeah. going to be a trap, because it is. Yeah. And I say that well, both humorously and seriously. There are, there are a lot of, I've had lots of conversations over the 12 years on the show. Mm -hmm. um, you could view almost any question that I asked in an argument as a trap because it's designed to expose fallacies in the arguments that are being presented. And so if your goal is to preserve your fallacious argument at all costs, you avoid those traps. But if you actually care about what's true and accurate, and if you care about following the evidence and reason where it leads, then those questions aren't traps. What they are is big lighthouses that are designed to lead you away from the rocks and towards reality. And if you are so resigned to piloting your ship on every whim and whimsy, you're going to hit those rocks. It's not a trap. It's a life preserver. And the quicker people start recognizing this and say, oh, I'm not going to let that Matt fellow, boy, he uses that, that logical jujitsu <laughs> stuff and scoops me in and just, I, it's a trap, it's a trap. Well, to the extent that it's a trap, it's a trap that is truthful and designed to actually help. Yes. You've uh, been on the show 12 years, right? More, yeah, a little more than 12 years and two months, three, yeah, four I months. I think this, um, this month is like, what, my ninth anniversary on the show? 21 years on this show between us. Yeah. You remember our first show together, right? Maybe. We did the show on circumcision. Oh, yes. That was a good one. Yeah, we, I love doing shows about things that make me cringe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't cringe with, with theistic. I, I tell you what, I, I don't want to drag this on. I do want to mention that after the show's over, people involved with the show get together and go for dinner at Star of India Restaurant, and they will have the address up there. There it is. 29, there it is. 2900 West Anderson Lane. For those of you watching on a delay, you'll see it after you hear it. But um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm do, I've done a lot of stuff. I, mm -hmm. I've done lectures, debates. Uh, I'm doing more and more of them, big talks, small talks, meeting up with small groups and large groups. Uh, I'm producing the Atheist Debates Project to try and give my thoughts, which, by the way, I'm not the ultimate arbiter of anything other than what I think and barely that. Um, but to the extent that I might have something that people could benefit from and learn you know, in the conversation, uh, I'm, I'm sharing that. I'm also far from perfect. I talk way too much. Uh, I need to... I, I, matter of fact, just for, just as a test, I'm going to try to sit through the entire next call and say nothing. No, that doesn't work. Or, or, just, or most yeah. mostly nothing. But um, I hang up on people on occasion. I've been known to call people names. I have been arrogant constantly. I acknowledge all these things. And if somebody were to call in and make an argument that I was a jackass in a particular situation, um, I'd probably agree to it. However, I don't think it would be very easy for somebody to go back through and find an error, a call, where no matter how heated it got, um, apart from simply misspeaking, I presented you with fallacious responses to your arguments. And if that they exist, I would certainly want to know about them and correct them, as we have on the occasions where any, any one of us have gotten something wrong, and it's nice to be corrected. Now, I'm not going to pull up a show from seven years ago and say, oh, <laughs> Matt said this when he should have said that, and, you know, we're not going down that path. Uh, although I am reminded of a call that Russell and I took many, 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 you know, like 10 or 11 years ago, probably, where the caller asked us about the ontological argument, and we gave 
brilliant responses to the cosmological argument. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if there was just something wrong with both of us or we misheard it or we fed off of each other to go down the path that we were going. Uh, but it was still a good response to the cosmological argument. And once we acknowledged that there was a problem there, yeah. we went back and looked at the ontological as well. It's just, I, pr I, want, his, I want theist callers to call in. Yeah. And we have one on hold, and I, Matthew, I'll get to in just a second. Um, and I know that for many people, it's their first time watching the show. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, people say, how can you keep doing this? Oh my gosh, haven't you heard this over and over? Yes, we have. Yes. Uh, and the reason I keep doing it is because it's somebody's first show and because I legitimately enjoy it. I enjoy finding new ways to express things, the, the match into outer space as, as a deconstruction of this arguing from the, gen from the specific to the general. Yeah. I think it's a good example. Somebody will yep. point out a flaw in it and it will get refined. I'm fine with that. What I'm not fine with is calling in, making a fallacious argument, and then being asked questions designed to direct you towards the fallacy Mm -hmm. And then duck and dodge and laugh and then claim you've proved your case. Uh, yeah. That might convince you, but it's probably not going to convince that many people watching and certainly not us. Yeah. But we have Matthew in North Carolina. Thanks. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. good. Thanks for waiting. Uh, I would like uh, first to um, give a shout out to my friends on the Atheist versus Christian Debate Central Facebook page. Um, they had encouraged me very strongly to call you, um, and I was not going to do it today, but uh, fortunately I had a chance to do it. I am a Christian, and uh, I debate on, on this page pretty often. Now, I just had one question for you, and maybe a follow-up question. Um, I know that you um, acknowledged being a Christian for years up until your uh, early adulthood. Are you talking to either one of us? Because that's true for both of us. Yeah. Yes, well, you you specifically. Uh, by the way, if any of you have children, Happy Mother's Day for uh, Jen. Okay. Um, if you have children, um, I do. I'm not sure. Like I say, I don't. I, I keep up with the show a little bit, but I don't know a lot about um, your your lives. But uh, every once in a while, I tune into the show as far as on YouTube after it's already been uh, recorded. But my question for you, Matt, was uh, since you acknowledged believing Christ as a child. Uh -huh. um, well, as an adult. Speaking, okay, yeah, up into an adulthood. Um, uh, hypothetically speaking, if you were to die and find out this everything in the Bible is true, could you ever stand before God and say, I never had enough information to believe you existed? Yes. And, okay. and, and moreover, if I were to die and find out that everything in the Bible is true, I would have enough integrity to identify that God as a moral thug. I've heard that plenty of times from atheists, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. Well, so you, you, if, if you, everything you in the Bible, if everything in the Bible is true, then God sanctions slavery, and that's immoral. Well, uh, as far as slavery, uh, uh, actually, Matthew, because we because that's my go-to yep. thing that we do over and over again. Instead of, yes. uh, let's just pretend like I didn't mention slavery and you can answer your follow-up. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, so you said that you could stand before God and say, I never had enough information to believe you, even though you were believing in him as a yeah. child. Yes, okay. uh, because it's possible um, to believe things for bad reasons, and the reason I don't believe is because I found out that I had bad reasons for my belief and could not find good ones. Okay, now this is my follow-up question, and that's really it. Okay. Um, could, uh, since um, you agreed that you believed in him for the wrong reasons, so to speak, as a child. Um, and an adult. And an adult. Um, could you acknowledge that possibly there is a such thing as a no true Christian? As, you know, a lot, uh, um, Anthony Flew coined the phrase, no true Scotsman. Um, okay, and he didn't, but... A yeah. common yeah. argument. Could, could yeah. you acknowledge that... I did not really understand what I was believing. Actually, he might have. Um, you're asking me if I can acknowledge that I think, I think you're asking me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that my view of Christianity when I was a believer may have been the, not correct, the incorrect view? Like there, there's some uh, other no, version? I don't, that's not necessarily the incorrect view because I've watched your... Um, I watched your 
deconversion story on YouTube, mm-hmm. and you said you went before, you believed, you said you accepted Christ into your heart, kind of, you know, believed all that stuff. Yes. Which is very yes. common if you study the Bible. We, it, it pretty much is open about children accepting Christ, you know, coming to Christ uh, from the mouth of babes. God has ordained praise. They naturally know, uh, according to the Bible, it teaches that they naturally know who their creator, who God is. Um, and you kind of demonstrated that there as a child. Then I, uh, I am just trying to, to. I don't understand your question. So maybe try and phrase it one more time. Well, the, okay. The second, the second part is, is since you acknowledge m- believing for the wrong reason, right. does that mean that you are a, not a true Christian to begin with? Ah, okay. Yeah. I actually have a video I posted um, about this. Um, specific, and I think it may be, it's on my YouTube channel. It may be called something like, you know, was I ever a true Christian or something like that. I have to look it up. So there is a longer answer to this, in part because uh, it came up in discussions with Ray Comfort. And my answer is okay. this. If your, your definition of true Christian is someone who actually has a relationship with the risen Christ, then I was never a true Christian. But I also don't believe anybody okay. else is because I don't believe there's a risen Christ to have a relationship with. If your, definition of true, okay. if your definition of true Christian is someone who is convinced that they have that relationship, then yes, I definitely was convinced. And, you know, I think what probably one of the, the biggest things that will maybe make this clear for you is I recently did a debate with um, Mike Lacona on the resurrection, and I did it at, a, at, at an unapologetics conference in a Baptist church. And, mem- mm-hmm. and members uh, of my former church, the First Baptist Church of Harvester in St. Charles, Missouri, that I hadn't seen in 30 years, flew down here to attend this debate, and one of them got up during the Q&A to basically say, hey, you may not remember me, but you know, back when you were active in the church, we all expected you to go on to great things and you know, all the sorts of things that you would expect from a, someone in the youth group who everybody expects to be a minister. And his question was basically, what happened? So not only was I convinced that I had this relationship, but the people around me, family and church members, were also convinced of that. Um, so whether or not I was a true Christian entirely depends on how you want to define it. Okay. So, um, one last question. As far as uh, this past October, you um, moderated a debate between um, Airman and Price. Yeah. And you, uh, you had kind of admitted that Airman done a better job uh, Preventing the evidence than Price did. Um, did. Did any of that persuade you towards, hey, maybe Christ is a historical figure, or is that something you're still kind of wrestling with? I don't have any problem with the idea that there may have been an actual person. Um, I think, for me personally, I remain unconvinced of the mythicist position, which would assert something, Jesus did not exist, that I don't think they can demonstrate. My position is there's still a big problem here because if Jesus existed and if he was divine and if he died for people's sins and was resurrected, etc., these facts should be wholly unassailable. They should be the most clearly attested, obvious. There should be no possibility that someone could object. And so while I'm okay with, uh, while I'm okay with the idea that there's, a, there's an actual person there, there may or may not be. There may be several people uh, there. But if you, if, you look through the new, if you look through the Gospels, for example, and start removing everything about Jesus' life for which we don't have independent, reliable confirmation, you know, we can't independently, reliably confirm miracles, um, we have no good reason to think that the words that are attributed to him written decades later are as accurate as some people might think they were. I mean, I've heard lots of speeches. I've heard lots of speeches in the last year. I've heard some that were incredibly important, and I might remember a phrase from it. But to think that I could recite the entirety of something like the Sermon on the Mount and not make mistakes is bizarre. Um, And Mm -hmm. when we have something like the Gospels, who we have no idea who wrote them, they weren't written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so... Those are, those are names that the church put on there. If we start extracting all the things that are, that are claimed about Jesus and say, this pile over here represents things we can't confirm, I understand why the mythicists are objecting, because the other pile is virtually non-existent. 
We can't confirm his birth. We can't confirm his parents, his relatives. We can't confirm his death. We can't confirm uh, even the, the they got the dates and the census wrong. They have different um, genealogies. We can't even confirm that his name was Yeshua, if, or if he was there. Maybe there were four different itinerant Jewish rabbis, because we know there were a bunch of messianic figures around this time that glo got glommed together and had things added to it. I can't, I, I'm not saying that that is the case. I'm just saying that it's not absurd to consider that as a possibility. And this is a damning problem for Christianity. The fact that they cannot unassailably demonstrate that Jesus was in fact a real person, let alone that he performed miracles and was divine, etc. So, I mean, I could concede that Jesus existed. I could concede that he did some of the things that are reported and that we have a somewhat accurate record of things he said, and that still doesn't get me anywhere near concluding that he performed miracles and was divine, or that this divine nature was something that I should care about, uh, because when we start talking about the idea of substitutionary atonement, the idea that a god would come down and take human form and kill himself to serve as a loophole for rules that he created, is already absurd and immoral. So, the question of whether or not it's true, I don't side with a mythicist in saying Jesus didn't exist, but I side with them in saying, boy, Christianity certainly can't, hasn't, and seems incapable of meeting its burden of proof that he did exist. Okay, if, if Christianity met their burden of, burden of proof, um, everything that you just mentioned, which obviously a lot of that you just mentioned would be, could be debatable as far as who wrote the gospel, stuff like that, because there are, you know, obviously I'm sure you know about several of the books out there that kind of trace that back and do it attribute um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to the uh, to writing those, which, you know, that's the basis. No. I'm not really well, interested no. in that at the moment. So no, re uh, yeah. no, no, not even New Testament scholars within Christianity hold to this idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, um, you, I mean well, you can find, no, you can find somebody, you can find somebody on the fringe of scholarship, just like you can find somebody on the fringe of scholarship yeah. within mythicism. But even within yeah, Christianity, in, in Christian, the, Josh McDowell, some of those is one I'm thinking about, and I know that you Josh McDowell does McDowell. not. To, if Josh McDowell but, says that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'll buy you a steak dinner. Okay. Well, here's. Oh, well, I, I can't tell you. James but he's still so wrong either way. But uh, yeah. uh, but here's my my view, my position on that, mm -hmm. because it's not their gospel; it's Christ's gospel. I understand why their names are not attributed to it because we're not we're not actually trying to give them credit for it. This is the gospel of Christ. So, what, 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 do what do you mean by what do you mean, Matthew? What do you mean by it's the gospel of Christ? It, well, obviously, you know, it's the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay, but um, if I write a book Jesus. about Elvis, is it my book or Elvis's book? Well, it the, it's would be your book. Obviously, okay. right. But we're we're not talking. See, what I'm saying is, Jesus. It, we're we don't worship them. You know, you would be no. acknowledged so, for, you would be acknowledged for being the author. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, so does that mean? Uh, does Elvis, that mean? Does it, it, even if you never wrote the book about Elvis, it wouldn't change who Elvis was. Somebody else would have written the book right. about Elvis. Right. But you don't get to assume that my you don't get to assume that my book about Elvis is factually correct. No, I'm not, I'm not saying you get to assume. You're an atheist. Obviously, you don't. Obviously, I don't know what being an atheist yeah, has know, to do with whether or not my book about Elvis is well, factually correct. I'm a correct. Christian. I, I, I obviously I take it on faith that everything okay. written is that, you know the, as as you as you then, know as a then, Christian, the then writing we can, Matthew, be live by faith. Matthew, we, we can have no conversation then, because if you're going to take it on faith that this is accurate, um, is there anything that you couldn't take as accurate based on faith? What do you mean in the gospel? In, anywhere. Anywhere. Couldn't you use faith to just be an excuse to believe whatever you want? Well, yes. Okay. It's so you, so that, yeah. that, Matthew, means that faith is not a pathway to truth, and not a reliable pathway to truth, right? No. Okay. No, it's not a pathway to truth. Okay. Like so why, why, ago, why, why, may be true, Matthew, correct? why, why then would you say that you accept this thing, the single most important thing, on faith? Because at, before I became a Christian at age 19, I read the Bible before 
there was a lot of things in it that, well, you know, this is, this is kind of interesting. I, I don't really quite understand it. Once I accepted Christ as my Savior, I started understanding it much more, started studying it more in depth. Um, and as I, as I started looking at the world through what the scriptures and, and my atheist friends would laugh at me just because I actually say I put my Bible glasses on when I look at the world. And what I have found is what the Bible pretty much says about the world has been demonstrated as far as I can say pretty accurately. Such as? Um, to take, take it, well, for example, for uh, uh, Matt brought up God being an immoral um, thug. God. Thug, thug. Yeah. Um, um, the Bible actually is pretty, and I believe it's um, Psalms or Proverbs 1, it says, uh, it pretty much says that. You know, there's some will view God as a shrewd God, some will view him as pure. Yeah. How do you um, tell which one of them is right? Well, obviously, if both of us, if there's some that view it one way and some the other, I would say at least in that instance, the Bible's got it right. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm saying if somebody, okay, here's this God character that we're told about, and I look at him as an immoral character, and you look at him as a moral character. And when I ask mm -hmm. you, and I ask you why you view him as a moral character, it's because you put on your God glasses and take it on faith. How do we tell which one of us is actually right about that character? Faith. That's all. You, you, but you take. Faith I don't. I don't. I don't right. need faith, and I don't have any use for faith. And by the way, I don't think you do either. For example, let me ask you this: Is it morally correct to own another person as property? Um, no. Okay. Then why does the Bible? not only allow it, but describe all the circumstances you would need to justify it. Actually, the Bible condemned slavery. No, no, it, no it, it doesn't. It. Matthew, now, no. Matthew, Matthew, Matthou Matthew. Thou shalt not thou shalt not steal. Yes uh, or no. Hey, Matthew. That had nothing their to will do. Stealing it. Okay, this is, the dishonest, yes no. this is the dishonesty of putting on your God glasses, because you're not actually looking okay. at it. Yeah. Matthew, Matthew, let me finish. You're not looking at it with your God glasses. You're looking at it with the God glasses of an interpretation of a particular selection. Have you read Exodus 21? I just want, yes. I, read, I, I, I just want a simple answer. Yes or no. When you take somebody against their will, is it stealing their freedom? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. That have, have you, now, now, will you answer my question? Have you read Exodus 21? Yes. What does Exodus 21 yes. say about slavery? I don't know. You have to quote the verse. Oh, it's the oh, whole, it's it's the whole yeah. damn chapter. The whole thing. And just for you, I'm going to read Which it. Which one do you... I'm going to read okay, it so ahead. that you don't say I'm taking this out of context. Exodus 21, this is the NIV. Do you have a preferred version? I can switch real quick. Uh, English Standard Version is our preferred version. Absolutely. I, you can do the NIV. I don't really care, but ESV is usually about the No, I will go preference. with the English Standard Version. Let me... Okay. Boom. English Standard Version. Oh, sorry. I picked English Standard Version Anglicanized. I should have just gone with English Standard Version. There, there we go. ESV. Here we go for fun. Now there are rules that you shall set before them. Exodus 21, beginning at verse 1. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve for six years, and in the seventh he shall go out for free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. He comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. So this is specific, the first few verses are specifically about Hebrew slaves. And it specifically says, when you buy your Hebrew slaves, and it applies to male slaves. It gives you the rules on when they must go free. But if you give them a wife and kids, they remain your property. But if the slave says, beginning at verse 6, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door of the outdoor post. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, basically pierce it. It's not a brutal. It's, I'm going to tag you like a sheep. Mm -hmm. And he shall be his slave forever. So already we have a way just with regard to the slavery of the Hebrews, that you can essentially trick and result in having a Hebrew slave that is yours forever. But it gets worse than you, that. Sorry? You would consider that a trick? Well, yeah. Hey, I bought a slave and I have to let him go after six years, but if I give him a wife and he wants well, to stay, he's mine forever? Yeah, I'd consider that a trick. How did he become how, a slave however, the however, slave Matthew, the Hebrew law? however, Matthew, the fact that you focus on that as a trick, rather than the fact that already we've shown that it is possible and encouraged by the Bible that you can buy slaves and that you have a specific treatment for Hebrew slaves, 
and that you can still end up with Hebrew slaves that are yours forever? Don't focus on the trick. Focus on the morality. Take your God glasses off for a second or your selective God glasses and continue. Okay, continue because all, I'm not done. Out. I'm not done. Oh, there's, I'm there's not more. remotely well, done. I'm not done. There's, okay. there's much more, Matthew. In verse okay. se- it, we're continuing on in verse 7. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. So now we have a separate rule for how to treat your female slaves. If she does not please her master, I wonder what that means, yeah. who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, wow, that's cool, he shall deal with her as a daughter. Oh, so now we bought a female slave, and eventually she gets to be treated like a daughter, which, by the way, is not necessarily right which is yeah. which is not necessarily a good thing, as daughters and wives are property and don't hold the same value or rights as men in the Bible that you're you're applauding. Uh, if he takes another wife to himself, hang on, what do you mean another wife? Does that mean the slave that he bought first was a wife? Because now we're talking about another wife. He shall not diminish her food, clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these things for her, then he sh- she shall go out for nothing. That's how they get out of it. So, verse 12, whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. This has nothing to do with slavery. It's just a general rule. If you strike a man and he dies, then you get put to death. But if he doesn't, uh, but if he didn't lay in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he can flee. But if a man willfully attacks another man to kill him by cunning. So basically we're going through, hey, here's some stuff going on. Whoever strikes his father or mother shall be put to death. Who steals a man and sells him. Whoever steals a man Mm -hmm. and sells him and found in possession of him shall be put to death. But let's continue down to verse 20. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged. For the slave is his money. This is, Exodus 21, by the way, is not the only passage that talks about this. There's also passages in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that specifically tell you to buy slaves from the heathen that surround you, that the slaves are yours. Yes, yes, you could bring up that after 50 years in the year of Jubilee, you have to let them go free. Uh, But, you know, how long did people live then? Uh, Argument over. Uh, But it says, these people become your property, become your money, they can be passed on to your children. What, You're talking about the foreign slaves, correct? And unless for, the for, for, foreign, for, foreign sla- right. for foreign slaves, it's explicit. For Hebrew slaves, it's only after you pierce their ear and they become your property forever. You can then pass them on to your children. However, here's the question. Is there anything that is immoral in what I just read? No, and here's why. No, you're done. No. Oh. And you can claim that I'm dishonestly refusing to listen to your garbage all you want. You can go throw a fit. You already acknowledge that it was immoral to own another person's property. And I just read you the verses that show you how you can buy the heathen from their lands that surround you and make them your property to pass on to your children and how you can also trick Jews doing into it. I'm not interested in your let me find a way to twist this and see if it makes it work because I'm more moral than that and I think you are too and I find it repulsive that your religion is poisoning you so much that you could start off by saying it's immoral to own people as property and when I read you the verse in your book that explicitly says in no no doubt about it no specific interpretation that you can own people as property and then I ask you if it's immoral your answer is no you are done here and you need to take a personal inventory of both your morality and your religion because it is inhuman and embarrassing. I just, I, you know, I, I have to say I love the, uh, the fact that you ask him if he had ever read Exodus 20 and he said, yeah, or Exodus in general. He said, well, yeah, and then he and didn't, he, he, didn't know what it was. So, yeah. It's, it's all right. It's I, like, I don't have every verse memorized. This is, just no, the convenient ones. No, but I mean that's kind of a central thing, and it's one of the things that if you're if you're a Christian um, and you don't wrestle with that particular part of the Bible, um, I think you're doing it wrong. Um, and and obviously, you know, James or or whatever his name was, he had come to terms with this in some way. Um, I think he's wrong, and I think it's immoral how he tried to justify that. Yeah, it's, but, I'm not interested in the tap dance. But, but I don't really, I don't, I don't get the sense that he actually had ever wrestled with that. Mm-hmm. I think he just accepted the justifications that he'd been provided. Well, this is and, the same thing I did. Well, yeah, and the thing is, what he was describing here when he said that 
as soon as he um, saw things through the lens of faith, mm -hmm. then he started to believe, you know, he started to see, you know, all this stuff. And that is a textbook description of indoctrination. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're indoctrinated that this is the way and this is how you have to see things and you just trust this inner feeling, this faith, then everything will fall into place. That, that's what indoctrination does to you. This it, is why when he, start, when he acknowledged that there's nothing that you can't justify based on a faith claim. Yeah. So he believes the Bible, he believes it based on faith. And so what he'll do is he'll pick out the verses that he thinks are opposed to slavery, as he did at the start. Mm -hmm. Oh, you shouldn't covet. Ah, yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I'm not opposed to coveting either. By the way, the United States is built on coveting, keeping up with the Joneses. It's right. What, it's Our what actually makes economic us... economic system is built on that. Holy crap, my neighbor just got a new car and it's way more awesome than mine. I covet it. And it can, in fact, encourage me to work harder and save more in order to get a better car, which might also be better for the environment. So coveting can lead to good things. The Bible is one of the most simplistic pieces of work ever written. Yeah. Don't, thou shalt not kill. Well, have, you, have you looked well, at the penal code related to killing another human being? There's <coughs> murder one, murder two, murder three, manslaughter, involuntary, homicide, all these things, because we recognize that life's more complicated than thou shalt not kill. Meanwhile, right after thou shalt not kill, comes a whole bunch of killing. Mm -hmm. Oh, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. My neighbor doesn't have an ox. Yeah. If, if the fact, the inclusion of the ox there, yes, I understand, it's about coveting anything. Uh, but if you were God, and you were inspiring, and you wanted to discourage people from coveting, would you actually include language about your neighbor's ox or ass? I mean, your neighbor might have a nice yeah. ass. Um, <laughs> but but would you, wouldn't you just go with, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's property? Yeah. Because nobody has, well, I, no, nobody around here has oxes. I mean, like regular. Yeah. You don't have an ox, do you? I don't have an ox. Because if you had an ox, that would be awesome. Because <laughs> I would be over at Jen's coveting that damn thing all the time. <laughs> Oxes are cool. Oxen. Oxes. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, I've lost the ability to speak English. I mean, and the thing that, to try to claim that thou shalt not covet means that you're not supposed to take slaves, all that means is that you can have slaves. You just can't covet your neighbor's slave. Yeah. You know? Hey, but by the way, uh, just as a tip for Christians, this won't help you out a whole lot, but it'll help you out a little bit. If somebody comes up to you and talks to you about slavery, don't go for verses about coveting. Instead, you might want to try going to where Paul uh, asks for his slave friend to be let go. That doesn't tell you anything about Paul's position on slavery or Jesus's or God's, uh, but at least it's stronger than thou shalt not covet. Yeah. Uh, ah. I, you know, I missed, I, I missed the, the one question that I love to ask um, and should have. If it's not immoral, James, will you be my slave under what the Bible says I'm allowed to do? Would you willingly agree, not even just let me purchase you and point to the Bible and say you, you have to go along with this. Would you volunteer to be my slave under what the Bible says about slaves and what I have a right to do to slaves? and what your rights are. I know you're not on the line anymore. That was a dramatic pause. Because I don't believe any of any person would do that. Just like your immediate impulse was to say, of course it's not moral to own people as yeah. property. You are better than your holy book. You are better than your God. You have benefited from an enlightened society around you that discovered, unlike the people who founded this nation, that slavery is immoral. Slavery is a stain on the United States and every other civilized country. And where it still goes on in some form or another, it's an abomination that deserves to be opposed nonstop. Almost everyone recognizes this. And yet when people get involved in trying to defend their religion, they will tap dance and twist and turn. Well, that was only moral then. Okay. Yeah. When did it stop becoming moral? When did it stop being moral and why? Why was it okay back then? Yeah. Did was God it okay to rape back then too? Yeah. Did God change? Yeah. Did the unchanging source of morality change at some point? It's, it's a bizarre kind of, I don't know. I, I, I've just been rambling on about this and we need to get to, get to some other callers. We've got James in Kansas City. Thanks for waiting. Uh, hi. How are you guys doing? All right. I'm exhausted. Good. 
I understand. Uh, Jen, happy Mother's Day. Thank Very you. Very thrilled for you. Thank you for all you do. For I'm a mother, too, a mother. just not of the same type. <laughs> I've heard you've been called a mother something many a times. So that's a whole other conversation. Um, I have two things that I wanted to get to if we have time. If not, I completely understand. Um, first, uh, I recently had a son, um, and uh, uh, he's a yeah. month. Thank you. It's a good thing um, you didn't have a daughter. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was still in Bible mode. Yes, we we're not back on slavery, hopefully. Um, but uh, uh, he's about a month old, um, and I had, I been, didn't didn't really give much thought to religion one way or the other. I guess you'd call me a non-believer, but um, as Jen can probably attest to, when the baby isn't sleeping, you will turn to anything to get them to sleep, and especially when you're sleep deprived. Um, I turned to prayer. Um, just a general prayer. I don't know particular God in mind. Um, and, uh, and I started flipping through the Internet and found your show. Well, every time your show comes on and man starts speaking, the baby falls asleep. Okay. Like clockwork. So I don't know if that makes Matt a God or God answering a prayer, but for whatever reason, every time your show comes on, I put it on for him. He falls asleep, guaranteed. Cool. Would you consider that a awesome. proof of God? Um, I, I'd love to go I, along with the joke and say yes, but I won't. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's it's just it's one of those things. I mean, I, obviously, I put a little bit of satire in it, but it is one of those things that I I had no other recourse, and I didn't, and it kind of fell back on you know the original you know learning about the you know teachings and all that, and kind of saying, eh. Well, ba no, babies didn't. love me in general, and I think it's because they think we have the same barber. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for whatever reason, um, I've had many people hand me their child, and it just falls right asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm glad that doesn't happen to the people on the other side of the glass, or I'd have to quit the show. But yeah, babies, cool. Get some rest. Uh, um, yeah, I just I don't like I said. It's just one of those things where I'm not 100 percent sure what it is if it's your soothing voice or or whatever but he just he falls asleep every time you're on um and i, I don't understand it uh the second point that i wanted to ask about was matt i had heard on a few of your episodes uh you said that it is not an atheist's job for um uh for proof against god Correct. although you could do it but I've never actually heard you do it, and I apologize if, if you if you have it in another episode or something I've never seen. But can I actually hear your argument for against God? No. Uh, so 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 here's here's the thing, and I will try to do this as quickly as possible, mainly because I've talked a lot. Um, it very much depends on which God we're talking about. Uh, but I'm writing a book called If I Were God, and one of the goals of this is to go through and show how the world that we live in doesn't make sense under almost any God proposition. Um, that there's some conflict there, no matter how we define God. Uh, unless we define God as just, you know, kind of like, if it's so ill-defined that it could be anything. So there's, there's the weak atheist position of, I do not believe that a God exists, which it probably better phrased, I am not convinced that God exists. Then there's the strong atheist position, which is, I am convinced that God does not exist. And those are subtly different. It's the difference between I'm convinced you're guilty and I am not convinced that you are innocent. That, that type of thing. The way I look at it is this. If you take the... We know, that, we know that all the claims about various gods can't be true because they are in contradiction with each other. And so we need some way to delineate which of them might be true. Um, or which of them, if any, is true. Now, most of them have this idea of a God that, um, for, for all the ones that have the idea of a God that cares about us and has some important message for us, um, those gods don't exist. Because if they existed, that would be in conflict with the fact that there's so much confusion about which God exists. It would be very easy for a God to reveal himself or herself to everyone. And the fact that this hasn't happened means there isn't a God that actually cares about clarity about the God question. So that throws out all of the organized religions. That throws out most conventional, nominal, classical theism 
versions of, of, of uh, religion and God. Uh, and it ties in with essentially the, um, the argument from divine hiddenness, which I've talked about and actually have a, a video about on my channel as well. For the other type, and I apologize, I don't know what that is. Yeah, the, well, you can go to my YouTube channel, youtubecom slash deity, or you can just Google Matt Dillahunty Divine Hiddenness, and you'll find the video. Um, it goes into cool. detail on that argument. So that leaves the non-interventionist gods, the deistic gods, the ones that may be malevolent or don't care about us or are intentionally hiding. And the thing is, a god that is intentionally hiding is, from our perspective, functionally identical to a god that doesn't exist. And so I can't demonstrate that that God doesn't exist because it's an unfalsifiable proposition. It's, it's something that I, I could not possibly show uh, the difference between. However, I don't need to and it's not my problem because I live in a world where those two things are logically equivalent. The deistic notion of a God, that there's a God who started everything off but doesn't intervene. There's no way for me to tell the difference between the universe I live in all right, to, to look at the universe I live in and determine whether it's the result of a God that started it off and doesn't intervene, or if there is no God that started it off and still doesn't intervene. And so from, from our standpoint, um, not only is the null hypothesis that there is no God, so we're starting off on good footing, the burden of proof hasn't been met for any of them. Most of them are in conflict with what we see and understand about the world. And therefore, I will not assert with, abs I, won't, I don't claim absolute certainty about anything, but I think there's, there's a reasonable confidence that no God that matters exists. So is, is it harder for you to argue against uh, just a, a deistic God than, like, say, the, the, the Christian God of the Bible and such like that? Well, it's, it's not so much that it's harder to argue against. It's, it's that it's impossible to argue for. They are, they are simultaneously, they are claiming to have detected the undetectable. They define it as undetectable. Here's a God that doesn't intervene. And yet they're claiming that they have good reason to uh, accept that proposition. And that would be like saying, um, I have an undetectable raccoon in my garage, and I've detected it. I'm, I'm convinced that that undetectable raccoon is in my garage. I mean, it's, a, it's an utterly fallacious, it's an absurd proposition. And okay. so I have no use for the deistic propositions, and I'm baffled Quite often, and I know I cautioned against this, and it's potentially insulting, I find the people who are, who are uh, supporting a deistic notion as, an, as a fact, not as a, a gateway to atheism or a stopgap against you know, religious intrusion in society, the people who are asserting it as a fact are wholly confused and quite often are terrified of the prospect of just simply acknowledging that they don't have good reason to believe a God exists. It's kind of like the people that claim to be spiritual but not religious. Yeah. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Jack, what is what is your what is your argument that um, of, for there not being a god? Or are you on, along the same lines as Matt? Yeah, I think I think Matt and I are actually in complete agreement on this. I mean, the, the burden of proof hasn't been met. Um, I at this point, I think that if you know, when we looked in all the places where. If a God exists, we should find evidence, and there is no evidence. You know, at some point, you know, I, I'm comfortable saying, hey, you know, this particular God does not exist. In the case of the Christian God, I think that particular God cannot exist. Um, so, although, you know. although, to be fair, there's not a Christian God. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, there's almost as many ideas about a Christian God as there are Christians. Yeah, Which so basically, is, I'd, I'd just be arguing... Isn't that a fallacy of the people? Well, so the thing is, if there's 100 people who tell me what they think the Christian God is, and they all present uh, a model that is contradicted by observations, all 100 of them are wrong, to say that there might still be a Christian God that none of these 100 people were aware of, uh, sure, I can't demonstrate that that's not the case, but what we can tell is that that Christian God doesn't seem to care to clarify uh, all this confusion about a God. And if, if every single person who's ever lived has been functionally wrong in their belief that a God exists because they believe in, it doesn't matter if there's some other God. If there's a God somewhere out there that nobody believes in and nobody has been arguing for, um, the time to believe it is after there's been a demonstration. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's this, um the saying that, you know, the theist God always hates all the same people that the theist hates. 
<laughs> and and the reason Funny for that, that I mean the reason for that is that it's it's coming right out of the theist head you know and we're we're coming up on we're coming up on time I want to try and get to a couple other callers but thanks James uh, hey, thanks. hey quickly what's the yeah. what's the weather in Kansas City right now because that's home 85 and sunny cool all right thanks yeah I was born in the Kansas City area not that it matters to anybody else but you know on occasion, because you know what? It's hot as hell in this studio right now. I, I don't know about you, but I'm like... I dressed for the studio weather, yeah. so... I'm wishing I had a fan at this point. Uh, all right, so... No, I'm not going down that path right now. Uh, we'll try this. Kieran in the UK, thanks for waiting. No problem at all. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty right. well. How are you? Very well. Happy Mother's Day to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so my thesis is basically that we, we, as a community, have um, have been completely blindsided by Islam. That we've been so uh, focused on this one. Hey, Karen. Sorry, go on. I, I'm just Hi. wondering, just for clarity, which community? The UK community, the US community, the atheist community, what? Or well, everybody? The, the, atheist, the atheist community, the skeptic community, that we've been, fo okay. we've been so focused on this one religion, uh, uh, Christianity, which, because that is the biggest challenge in our local environment, that's what we've been embedded in all our lives. But ultimately, the biggest problem religion in the world today is Islam. Now, I, I don't know what it's like over there, but... Well, it's, well this is simple. <laughs> so this is simple. I, I might agree with you that worldwide, the biggest religious threat to individual liberty and freedom is Islam. Uh, wow, what was that noise? Right. Uh, I, I might agree with you that that's the case. That doesn't mean it's the biggest threat in the United States. It doesn't mean it's the biggest threat in Texas. It doesn't mean it's the biggest threat in Austin or my neighborhood. It also doesn't mean um, that my efforts in another area won't affect that. For example, if what we're actually opposed to is violations of the separation of religion and government, and we're addressing mm -hmm. the single religion in the United States that is the biggest uh, uh, imposition and opposition to, to that uh, status. The, the biggest imposition on that status by far. Yes. Yeah. It's not even close. Right. Then by, by protecting right. that, we, we basically inoculate ourselves against the potential harm and threat of a religion, uh, of some other religion coming in and taking over the government. I'm not sure if that's true. How is it not true? How is it not true that if in impo opposing Christian intrusions on liberties here, we build up a system that guarantees that religions can't intrude? then Islam is not going to be able to come over and like, take over the government. Because Islam, unlike Christianity, is protected by a cloak of political correctness. If you criticize Islam... It doesn't... No, it isn't. Racist, it doesn't... Wait, even it, if it was, that, yeah. even if it was, what, what difference does that make? They don't get... They don't, if we have laws that prevent... That are, that are strong against religious intrusions in government, then they apply to all religions. I agree, and that's how it should be done. But let me let me give you the situation over here in England at the moment. We're in a situation where if you we have magazines that can say whatever they like about Christianity. They can mock Jesus. They can have cartoons saying pretty much whatever they like. But if you say something against Islam or Muhammad, their, their prophet, then you can literally get the police knocking on your door. Yes, in England, you, the you, mother. Of, do you know why? That is, do you know why? Because we. Because of hate speech, because, because the because UK because the UK has awful free speech laws that yes. offer regulation based on offense. Yes, but it, but but that is selective against which religion it is because that so, isn't enforced against. So um, you can say, work toward making it not selective. So so what we're talking about here it, is it is having laws that broadly prevent religious intrusion into government and it doesn't it doesn't matter what kind of religion it is and so it shouldn't do you're right and so that's what you guys I, need I, to I, work I, for I, I, over there yeah so what we have what we have is a fundamental difference in the existing laws with regard to what what people can say now I get what you're saying um, that that a tenor of political correctness or I'm not even necessarily sure that that's the right word if it is the right word it, Okay. If the public view has been twisted such that we can't criticize X is, is offering an unfair advantage to a particular religion that wants to intrude on a government, 
then that is definitely something that needs to be addressed. However, if it seems to be that it is this in conjunction with some rather sloppy laws, um, the, the very idea that we would have a law uh, based on offense, you know, oh, you offended someone. Yeah, that's absurd. Uh, this is this is my. I just I talk with my friends in the UK all the time about this. About there's fundamental disagreements about what should be permittable uh, with free speech. And I won't pretend that the U.S. has managed to absolutely perfectly nail it, but I will defend every day that the UK's ver the U.S.'s version of free speech is superior than to the UK's. Agreed. Agreed. But that's 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 different. Kind of that's different. That's different. That's different, though, from what the general tone in society is about what is appropriate or inappropriate. And there's massive <coughs> disagreement on all those things. What I what I think I, is. I, I, it, what I think is it, Can it, I say something? Sure. I just think that you guys over in America really need to see what's happening in Europe as an example, and you should really be careful because once the Muslim population gets beyond a certain percentage, no. they start. They start to. Yeah, yeah. No, no, they, no, no, they, no. They, they start to organize politically and impose Sharia law, whether you like. No. To, uh, well, no. They can't not going to happen here. here. They can't do that here. It's. It's your laws that are the problem. Okay, well it's then, not the well population America, of Muslims. And and if that started well, and if that started America to happen, if, if that started to happen, then you stand up in opposition to that. That's right. America will be left as a citadel by itself while the rest of the Western world becomes an, an Islamic Sharia state. So okay. And, and so are you calling? Are you calling us to have us come fix what's wrong in the UK? No, of course not. But I do okay. Think you should see us as a warning. And you should take the you should take it seriously because uh, I no, do. Uh, but the thing is, it, I don't think you understand that the situation here is fundamentally different because of the way our laws are written. It, no, it's because of the population of Muslims. No, there. it's not. No, it's not. It's absolutely not related to the population of Muslims. You don't think these European countries had all these different legislations protecting free speech? And no, they, not the way the U.S. does. Yeah, no, they, they the don't. The, the Europe's views on free speech are a fundamental problem. You know, you can't be a Holocaust denier and speak in Germany. Yeah, I do know that. But okay, I'm about the Islamic I, could, I could be a Holocaust denier here in the United States, I would, and and I would be derided for being a ridiculous. Uh, ill-informed buffoon, but I could do it. It, it happens so slowly. You, you guys don't understand. It's uh, okay. piece by piece. It's this, <laughs> it's this creeping theocracy. The bigger the population... We, we don't have becomes. creeping theocracy here, okay? The, the, the theocrats here are actually in our government, and it's they're not Islam because, or Muslims. They're, they're Christian dominionists. Sorry? Okay, look, when, a big problem is that people aren't allowed to say what they think is true here. When people talk about extremists, radical Islam, what they're really talking about is just orthodox, conservative Islam. Because, you know, there's nothing extreme in what ISIS are doing in terms of what is in the Quran or the Hadith. Everything that the Islamic State do is pure Sunnah. They back up everything they do with scriptural texts from Islam. I find it bizarre, you know, that, I find it bizarre that you don't think I'm aware of what you're saying. Yeah. If you don't think that... I did, I it, just said it, I find it bizarre that you yeah. don't think, that you think I don't know what you're telling me. Do you not think this can happen to America like it's happened to all of these European countries? No, like no, no, UK? no, no, not, the, not in the same way, not along those lines. But what I said was, I find it bizarre that you think I'm not aware of the information you're relaying. <laughs> I, 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 I am so relieved that you do agree with me, because over here, it's Where almost did, like... We, I, did no we agree? One, no one's allowed to talk about this. Um, okay, that's not true. Not that's not that, that that's just not true. You you are exaggerating the thing. Are you saying Pat Condell can't talk about it? I, I disagree with him on all kinds of things, but he certainly seems to be able to talk about it. Are you saying I'm that saying you're not allowed public, to talk about it? Aren't you in the UK? I'm saying any public politicians, any public uh, speakers, if they say anything against Islam. That's it. Their, their career is over. That's their entire life. Yeah, right. that means you need to change your culture. It's Western culture we need to change. It's not, not Western culture. It doesn't, that doesn't exist here. 
You don't think political correctness is bigger against Islam? I, I, I think, let, me, let me demonstrate how different the two governments are between our two, two nations. You say that anybody, uh, a political figure in the UK, who said something negative about Islam, uh, their career would be over. In the United States, any politician that says something negative about Islam, their career is off to a roaring start. No, that's not what I'm saying. No, I'm I, saying I, I, that. I, I, I'm saying that that is the fundamental difference. I'm saying that we have in the United States a parade of people who think that oh, it's th that it's okay uh, to put up Islam as the scariest. It, it, this is the boogeyman. Islam is the boogeyman that Christian dominionists try to use in the United States to bolster their political positions. And in your but, but, place, it's the on, opposite. Hold on, hold on. Trump, Trump tried to ban. Uh, about six failed states from yeah. e extremist Muslim countries, and all shit broke loose. Yes, and yes. it should have. As as it should have. It's a it's a it was a violation of the Constitution. You do not get to just regulate based on religion. We have freedom of religion here. Yeah, for American citizens, not for the rest of the planet. No, it. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. You cannot ban people based on their Who religion. Who does the Constitution apply to? Who does the Constitution apply to? American citizens. Yes. Yes. Is the Not president? The and it also it also limits the powers of the president and the Congress, etc. However, no, no, no. how? Saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, planet. hang on. Are you suggesting that the United States should prevent Muslims from entering the nation? I think that would be an incredibly prudent move on your on your part. Yes. Uh, I think I think that you are a reactionary buffoon uh, yeah. because. There are plenty of Muslims that don't represent a threat in the way you you have become I so agree. you okay. So then that can't be the criteria that we use to determine who we're going to give not asylum to. I'm talking about Muslims. I'm not talking about Muslims. You I'm just, about you just I just asked you, and you said it would be very prudent for us to stop Muslims from entering the country. Yes, it would be. Why? Because of the ideology that they hold. Okay, but not all Muslims have the same ideology. First of all, of course. Okay, so if not all Muslims have the same ideology, why would it be prudent for us to stop all Muslims from entering the country? Because within Islam, politics and religion are not different. They're combined within the same thing. I, yeah, I understand that that's the case in nation states where the, where the Islamic regimes no, are no, no, the no, state. It's not, it's, not it, it's, not, it's not nation states. It's the Quran, it's the Hadith, it's an entire way of life. It's do do you understand that not every Muslim gives a rat's ass what a particular interpretation of the Quran? Do you not understand that there are Muslims living all over Dearborn that are running around getting tattoos and partying and not caring too much about their religion? In the same way that we have liberal and moderate... Do, do we, in the same way that we have liberal, moderate, and fundamentalist Christians, this exists within Islam as well? Yes. Do you realize that I've got lots of Muslim friends who drink alcohol and eat pork and do all these other things? Yep. They call themselves Muslims, but they are not Muslims. Okay, but they if they call themselves them. Muslim and you stop them from coming into the country because they're Muslims, now you have eliminated their influence on Muslim culture. Because there's no way of telling the ones that just want to be peaceful, normal guys and the ones that want to behead you. Sure. How, how, do, I tell the, how do I tell the difference between visitors of the UK who are sensible and who are not? Should we, should we stop no, UK visitors? Do you realize the Muslims are allowed to lie to non-Muslims? Yeah. Yes. Do you realize that anyone is allowed to lie? Yeah. I know that Christians aren't supposed to lie. No. <laughs> uh, so, so, wow. Yeah, and yet there is there are, anything you won't believe? There are and all kinds of justifications of, of Christians lying to non-believers or people I, of other faiths. I know faiths. that, but they are advised not to lie. Muslims so are what? Hula. what? So what? No, no, I'm talking about doctrine. Okay, so can, what? can you tell the difference between a Muslim who's going to lie and a Muslim who's not going to lie? A Muslim who's going to actually support a theocratic view that's going to marginalize you and one who's not. And if your solution no. is just to allow none of them into the country, how does that help anything? Because it stops them from committing uh, terrorism. And, okay, and so, so since I can't tell whether or not you're going to say something sensible or not, I should just hang up on you now. Because I don't, I don't know. 
I don't care. I'm this is about that. this is about we're way we're way over time on the show, you see. And I need to figure out if I should stop the call now so that everybody can go to dinner. And so I have to make a judgment about whether or not it's in my best interest to continue listening to you to see if you're going to say something okay. sensible. And if I can't tell, wouldn't it be most prudent of me just to hang up? Well, let me try and say something sensible. I, I, why I don't you answer that question? This is about what yes. you can identify. Then yes. Okay. Is it possible? Is it that? is it possible? that there are violent dominionist Christians who would like to immigrate as well. How many... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, is, that, is it possible? Jihadists. How many jihadists are Christians? Is it possible that there... Are, are you not aware of the dominionist Christian movement that wants a theocracy? I don't oh, think he's aware of it. That was recently experienced. Okay. 99% of it is Islamic. I don't give a shit. I'm asking... Christian? Look. Here's, you think here, right? here, are, here are two, here are two here are two Christians. Tell me which one is a dominionist bent on a theocratic rule of the United States. Can you tell the difference? Christians. Can Christian you tell the fucking well, uh, difference? No. Okay. So now we have two Christians that you can't tell the difference between, and two Muslims that you can't tell the difference between. And you're yes. you're saying it's prudent to not allow either Muslim in, or would you also say it's not prudent to allow either Christian in? No, I would say look at the track record of Christian immigrants compared to Muslim immigrants. Yeah, I have and looked at the track record of yeah. Christian immigrants. Christians are trying to make the laws of the government of the United States conform to their religious views. They vote along those lines. They are marginalizing the rights of LGBT communities and more. Should, Which, should we not oppose that? On subways? Are, they be, are they beheading soldiers in the streets? You know what? This is are the fallacy of relative crazy? privation, where yeah. you, are, you seem to only care about what you view as the biggest problem. And I'm trying to point out there are other problems as well. And solving the problems that you can solve will insulate you to some extent against the other problems. And see, this is, this is one of the things that... No, 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 uh, stop, stop. I'm, we started this segment of the show with a discussion about the discriminatory legislation that the Texas legislature has put forward here. And it's based on Christianity, a Christian interpretation of what the law should look like. The effect of those laws will be that transgender kids, gay kids will kill themselves because we know that's what happens when they're subjected to reparative therapy or they are completely excluded from public life or their parents, they're outed to their parents. Um, when they have no safe place, they kill themselves. They put forth laws okay. that restrict the ability of women to even access basic medical care. And the net effect of that is the maternal mortality rate in this country looks like, or actually in this state, looks like that of a third world country. Because women are not being able to access basic health care, including prenatal care, um, reproductive health services, there's a whole range of stuff. People die because of the laws these people pass, and they pass these laws based on Christianity. It's not based on Islam. They are trying to enact a theocracy here. This is what we're up against, and that's why we're saying it's not about political correctness, that we don't you know, like lose our shit over Islam all the time. Yeah, I'm aware of what's going on in Europe and, and ISIS, and you guys need to work on your laws, but we don't have that same problem here. We have another set of problems. And it's focused on, on Christian dominionism. I wish we had the problems you guys had. Well, that's all I can say. Well, fix wow. your shit and you'll yeah. have those problems. I can guarantee you, you'll end up with those problems. Because while C of E is, is this largely you know, warm, fuzzy, I don't give a damn about religion, religion um, once, once you get rid of your Muslim problem and fix your laws uh, regarding free speech, I'm pretty sure the Dominionists will be parading your way just like they've done in Australia. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, the, the issue here is you, you have a very, let me see if I can make this easy. You have in your nation a problem that is a huge concern for you and others. And I see that and I agree with it. I, I agree that there is a problem there and that you, you, you need to do work. But calling us to tell us, hey, you guys should watch out, we've got this problem over here. We're aware of that, but we got problems of our own. Yeah. And so it's about triage. It is about figuring out what you can do and what is most important and significant at that time. The problems in the UK with regard to 
pick your poison. It doesn't even have to be, you know, Islamic stuff. It could be UKIP or whatever else. That whatever problems are going on there, I have my own batch of problems here. And if my work in changing people's minds and opposing legislation that is of a religious nature succeeds, and I'm not, I'm not alone. This is, I'm just talking in turn. I'm, I'm Matt's doing it all by himself. I'm, I'm saying that if that succeeds, it will serve as an insulative barrier against the kind of problems that you're having. Is it a foolproof thing? Is it no? Is, is there a guarantee? No. But what I'm going to try and do is work on the side of freedom and liberty and not pretend that because I can't tell the difference of who the bad guy is in this circle versus the good guy in this circle, that it's good for me to just disregard all of them. Instead, first of all, one of the, the, the radicalized ISIS people in the United States, they're not immigrants. A good chunk of them were, were, were born here. Okay? Amen. So if we're going to work on changing people's minds, rather than saying, I can't tell which of you is evil and which one of you is not, so I'm not going to have anything to do with you, any of you. Why not build communities that get people to acknowledge what the laws should be, how we best protect our citizens, how we best encourage freedom, and fundamentally reform Islam by changing the world around it in the way that we have dramatically, but not wholly, reformed Christianity by changing the world around it. Okay, you, hey, you say that we should try and reform Islam. I would argue that we are already experiencing an age of reformation in the Islamic world. Me too. Boko Haram, Me too. the Islamic State, al-Shabaab, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, al the other, al-whatever. These are all reformation movements aimed at bringing back the faith to its pure and original form. Yes. They are sadly uh, very accurate in their assessment of Islam and Muhammad. But that is what reformation is. It, reformation they, means they are accurate. The original source. They are accurate in the versions. It, it's basically, it's cherry picking. It's the same thing the Dominions do. It's the same thing the God Hates Fags people do. Um, they're going to cherry pick the things, and they are in, on firm no, no. biblical footing. They are on firm it's Quranic not, footing. It's not even cherry picking. It's just it accurate. is cherry picking. Within the Quran, there are two dramatically different versions of Muhammad and what he's arguing for. There's Muhammad. Uh, before and after Medina. And th whichever one you yeah. fo focus on determines what your ideology is going to be. Yeah, but because of abrogation, the latter verses within Medina are, are prioritized. So the, Medi so the Meccan verses are almost put irrelevant. All those peaceful things... They're not irrelevant. The They're not irrelevant across the board. Yes, it's a troubling... Okay, si yeah, yeah, oh my God. Yes, it's a troubling right, situation. Right. The fact that we haven't solved the f problem... Entirely. There is no solution. There is no solution. Well, then why are you never... talking to me? You're completely wasting my time. We run 12 minutes over, and you are so negative-minded that you think there is no solution. I can give you a number of solutions. Reform towards the Mecca verses. Then you go to work to demonstrate that there's no good reason to believe in a God or in these other things. And then you work to establish uh, interactions between the, the nation states that are fundamentally based on Islam and other free nations, and you build up and you bombard them and you give them free internet access and you build up, the, you, you relieve the poor, and you show that there's a better way of life. This is an overwhelming impetus for change, recognizing that there is a better way of life, that your religion that you've been, that you bought into, that makes you wear a sack so that nobody can see anything but your eyes, so that you can't go out, you know, without the company of men, you can't drive a car. This sort of rebellion is happening. The fact that there are violent regimes that are focused on one aspect of Islam, which is horrific, is a real problem. The fact that we haven't solved all the problems doesn't mean there is no solution. And I have absolutely no time and no interest in wasting time with someone who is relegated to the position that there is no solution. And if all you did was to call up and bitch that there's no solution, and that we're, you, oh, this is terrible, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, it's going to keep falling until jackasses like you recognize that you shouldn't give up that you should try to change the world, that humanism, skepticism, education, these are the cornerstones of how we build a better society. And just because it doesn't happen overnight for the spoiled brats who want everything now and everything fixed and everything free, you got to actually do some work. And if you throw your hands in the air, you're not a friend of me, and I don't need to hear from you on the show. On that note, we'll be going to Star of India restaurant there at yeah. the thing.
I don't know if you had anything to add to my... No, it's just like, it reminds me of the people who say, oh, you, you know, the uh, regressive liberals are afraid to say radical Islamic terrorists mm. because that's a magic incantation that... I, I don't yeah. know if I'm a regressive liberal or not. It just depends on who you shit. talk to, but I'm happy to talk about radical Islamic terrorists because yeah. it's a real thing. Yeah. Uh, causing all kinds of problems. Yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't solutions to the problems. And if, you, if you've got your mindset that there's no solution and you're willing to throw out the baby with the bathwater, we'll yeah. throw you out and I'll move on to keep doing what I'm doing. Doesn't this, by the way, I mentioned the fallacy of relative privation, which not everybody's aware of, but it comes up over and over and over and over again. And it's this idea that you can only focus on the one biggest problem. Why are you yeah. focused on, you know, cure an athlete's foot when people are dying of cancer? Well, maybe because there are people also working on that, but we have a cure for athlete's foot now. Oh, well, why are you focused on, you know, this little simple piece of legislation here instead of whether or not, you know, um, climate change? Well, I think climate change is a really big issue that we should, in fact, be focused on. I think we're making a lot of mistakes there. But to say that we should only focus on that to the exclusion of other problems is a mistake. This idea of triage, of figuring out, first of all, what can I do? That you've all heard, think globally, act locally. When it comes to morality, one of, one of the, the tenets that I ascribe to is, what would the world be like if everybody took the action that I'm considering taking? Now, of course, there's exceptions to that. If, if, if I'm getting ready to eat a, a sandwich and everybody in the world ate a sandwich all at the same time, that's a problem. But in the sense of trying to figure out decision-making issues, if everybody in the world decided that there's no solution and we should give up, I know that that world is worse. Yep. Because that world ceases to exist. We'll see you next week. Thanks to everybody in the studio for making the show and the people on the other side of the glass who were applauding and laughing and whatever else they yeah. did. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.